Yeah, thank you for that introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm super excited to be here to talk to you about language models and ethics. My name is Roma Patel. And as you just heard, I just graduated and finished my PhD at Brown. Um, and I just started as a, re as a research scientist at DeepMind. And what I'm going to be talking to you about today is a little bit different from the rest of what you've seen today. So I know today was like the NLP day. You've learned, you guys are like experts in language models now. You know everything about like building them and what it takes to actually get them to generate text well. But what I'm going to cover is just like the other side of the veil where when you have these language models and you have the tools to build them, it's also important to think about all of the ethical and like legal ramifications and things that could go wrong when you build them incorrectly or build them in ways that might harm humans or other individuals that interact with these language models. So let's begin with an example of something that has happened in the world that has actually affected individuals badly with language models. So here's an example of um, an example that took place a few years ago, but there was this Palestinian man who posted on Facebook this picture of him at his job where he's trying to operate this machine. And in Arabic, he posted, good morning. Now on Facebook, when you have, and as you've seen on like Google search, when you post in different languages, they give you the option to translate it to English or any other language that you speak. And this Facebook machine translation system incorrectly translated this Arabic sentence that said, good morning, to saying, attack them. Now, the Palestinian police saw this, they saw this post that said attack them with a picture of like this machine that looks kind of dangerous. And they actually went and they arrested this man. And there were all these news articles that showed how just like this one simple translation of something by a language model can actually cause someone to end up in jail, which is just like harmful to their entire life and their career. Um, and it's just something that we don't ever want to happen again. And Let's stop for a minute and think about why this happened in the first place. And over here, it's probably the case that the people who were building those automation systems, so the machine translation system, weren't actually thinking about and understanding the landscape of all of the potential effects that could have happened with their machine translation system. So if they had sat down and actually thought about how there were these certain contexts, for example, if there was a man or some individual in some sort of Middle Eastern country um, where, um, maybe police forces are more rigid um, in certain instances like that, in certain contexts like that, this sort of translation into sensitive material is actually far more harmful and could affect individuals' lives. And what people don't always ask when they're building these sorts of systems is, in every possible context that my model can be used, is there some way that it can be harmful if it is deployed? And if there is, if there even is like the slightest inkling of a thing that could go wrong and that could affect someone's life, then that's probably something that you should not be letting your model be deployed for. Um, and in this talk, I'll go over like all of the different ways that we can account for the possible ethical ramifications of language models and why this is important to consider. Um, a second example from a slightly different field, which is the field of computer vision, is um, facial recognition. So there was a paper a while ago that it was called like the gender shades paper, where they looked at how if you look at the performance of machine learning systems, and if you look at different gender identities or different like skin colors of individuals, there's actually a big difference in how a standard computer vision model that just aims to detect faces of individuals works. So it works really well on people with lighter colored skin, but on people with darker colored skin, it just fails to detect them. And again, there's like this big disparity between how this is unfair for certain individuals, and it just excludes like a whole class of people in the human race um, for which these automated systems just don't work. And again, this is something that should be considered when you're building these systems, because we would want them to be fair and equitable across all humans that we would want to build systems for. And again, this probably happened because the people who were building systems didn't actually understand the full landscape and the potential effect that their machines could have. And it's also always good to ask whether or not there's some context where your model might exclude entire classes of people um, and might discriminate against them in some way. Um, which is why this is a very important thing to think about. And in the context of language models, what I'm going to be talking about is what are the potential risks of large language models? So what are the ways that 
things could go wrong when you deploy these models in downstream tasks. So for example, if you use them in Google search or you use them in any machine translation system or autocomplete system that you have on all of your cell phones, what are all the potential risks and the ways that this could impact humans who are interacting with these systems? Um, I'm going to rely on a lot of work from um, Emily Bender, um, who is a professor at the University of Washington, who's been talking a lot about these ethical concerns. And there was also a recent paper by Laura Weidinger and others at DeepMind. Um, and a lot of the content of this talk um, is built upon things that they've been talking about and papers that they've been publishing. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to segregate all of the risks into these three big risk factors and the things and like the major risks that can occur from large language models. The first one is risk to humans. So how can these automated systems or language models that are deployed in a lot of the products that we use, how can they cause harm to humans, for example, how can they possibly discriminate against certain groups of humans? And how can we try to stop this by building into the system certain methods and safeguards against this? Are there potential privacy concerns of having these models that have been trained on like all of the massive amounts of text on the internet? And is this a cause of concern for us as individuals if we have private information of ours that can now be leaked if the language models have had access to it? Um, there's also a concern of misinformation. So if these language models have the ability to generate very realistic text, um, is there a concern that they might they might generate false text and people might read that and then believe it and this just spreads misinformation in the world? The second section that I'm going to talk about is risk by humans. So there are, there are certain cases in which there's like malicious intent of humans, for example, people who scam other people, and there are lots of cases of fraud. And now that we have these language models that actually sound very realistic and can be deployed in automated systems that make things easier to work with, um, these language models can be used by people who have malicious intent. Um, and it's good to think about all of the possible ways that the model that you're building could be picked up by someone else who might have some sort of malicious intent and how this could affect others and cause harm in the world. And then again, spreading misinformation. If there are like certain political parties or people who might want to spread some notion of truth that's been slightly tweaked to shed like their party in a better light, this is now easier to do now that we have these large language models that can generate lots of text very freely. Um, and then the third section that I'm going to talk about is the risk to the environment. So if we have these large language models, um, that takes a lot of compute to train, um, not just to train, but also like the energy demands that you need. Um, we're going to cover how this is potentially, so this is harmful to the environment in terms of carbon emissions, but it's also potentially harmful to a lot of communities in the world whose jobs might be taken over because language models can automate a lot of the tasks that used to be um, done by a lot of humans in this world. So let's begin with the first section which is risk to humans. Um, so the first thing to think about is discrimination against groups of humans or groups of people in the world. So for example, if we think about stereotypical bias, um, there was a paper a while ago that tried to go over all of the, the ways that people, that stereotypes are formed about people. So for example, um, if you look at the context in this first um, little box over here, it says girls tend to be more dashed than boys. Saying something like soft is an obvious stereotype. Um, it's just something that's been classified. It's like an overgeneralized belief about a group um, that a lot of people seem to believe, but it's not something that's always true about um, that certain group of people. And also in some contexts, it's very harmful to have these sorts of overgeneralized beliefs because not everyone actually fits into this. Um, and then especially if you see in the second box at the bottom, um, if you, so this is data that was collected in this paper, um, there's lots of instances where, for example, if the context is he is an Arab from the Middle East, um, there's lots of instances where sentences such as he is probably a terrorist with bombs, which is the stereotype of that context, um, are actually associated with sentences and people who fall into that domain or race. Um, and again, this is extremely harmful because it's an overgeneralized belief. More often than not, it's not always true. And this is not something that we want language models to just spew out. Um, however, there's also been a lot of work like the papers that we cited at the bottom that show that models, when trained on all of the data on the internet, learn these stereotypes remarkably quickly. So if you asked models, 
to, if you give them the context that says girls tend to be more dash than boys, some of these papers found that models will always defer to the stereotype um, because that's what they believe, because that's what they've seen from all of the massive amounts of training data that they've had. And if you look at the second little box that we saw, if models do actually generate, he's probably a terrorist with bombs instead of some of the other sentences, that's actually really harmful and not a thing that we want models to do, which is always defer to a stereotype, especially a stereotype that can be harmful to a certain group of people. Um, and again, there are more examples, and this is like an example from a model that was generated where if you ask a question and you ask, you give a prompt to a model and ask it to generate something, and if the prompt was two Muslims walked into a dot, 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 um, the model might answer something like a Texas cartoon contest and open fire, which again is very unfair to that group of people um, and also untrue in lots of instances. Um, and the reason that we need to be thinking about this and properly understanding how this comes about is because these models have been trained on all of the data on the internet. Um, and it's important to think about the fact that in this, the training data that they've seen, it reflects historical patterns of unfairness and unjustness um, from all of like the years and the historical bias that has accumulated and things that people have said over the years is all contained in the training data of the models. And when they train on this data um, and they pick up these contextual cues of things that occur in correspondence with certain racial groups of people and certain words that occur with them, all of these co these co-occurrence statistics are what they use to then generate more text and then they defer to the stereotypical biases. Um, and it's important to think about the fact that because models have been trained on all of the data on the internet and because there are historical patterns of unfairness, um, this is something that we need to safeguard against. So we can't actually just always deploy these models in very sensitive situations when we know that they do actually have the stereotypical bias and they must because of the data that they've been trained on. Um, it's also important to think about the fact that some communities are represented far more in the training data that is all of the text in the internet than other communities so if you think about the fact that like the english speaking population is probably what populates most of the text on the internet and that probably falls into like a big part of the world of the western world there's also other communities that fall into other parts of the world and these don't actually exist in as large a proportion as the western world on the internet and what this means is that your training data is biased because the communities are just represented very differently, um, which means um, models are not going to perform as well on different sets of um, things that refer to different communities. And given this also, given this disparity in the amount of data that exists with different communities, it's worth noting that if we have toxic or unfair language that surrounds some communities, and if there's not a lot of other data with language that surrounds those communities. This means that all of the data that exists with these communities is just going to be unfair language. And this is now exacerbated with this training data bias. And this might cause models to always degenerate into toxic text when they're talking about these certain types of communities. And as we saw before, they do actually degen degenerate into like harmful and toxic text, which is something that we should safeguard against and think about. So the first lesson is to think about the training data of models, uh, to think about what they might have seen in their training data. It might have been stereotypical bias, it might have been toxic language, and to try to safeguard against that. And be aware of that when you're deploying models in downstream tasks, because there could be harmful consequences. Um, the next thing that, um, a next potential ethical concern with language models is exclusionary norms. So for example, if you ask a language model a question such as what is a family, the model will say a family is a man and a woman who get married and have children. Now this is a standard definition of what a family is. It's like the norm of what a family is. However, this doesn't account for like all the other types of families that exist. So there can be non-heteronormative families. There can be families um, that don't just have one man and one woman and have children, but you can have children out of wedlock. They can have step cousins and sisters. You can have single parent families. And also you can just not have children at all. And these are all still definitions of families, but our language models just defer to this one definition of a family, which excludes all of the other communities that should actually be validated, both by society and also by these models if they're going to be generating text in the world. So for example, when models 
so for example, when models say things like both genders, this excludes the possibility of having non-binary gen gender identities. Um, and this does occur often in language use in data, and people have seen that models do defer to this. Um, and it's important to think about the fact that since language models might have learned these from data, and if you're going to be using them to generate text, for example, in some sort of chatbot setting to talk to humans, these norms, like perpetuating these norms to real individuals when you're talking to them, can actually place like a psychological tax on people who don't fit these norms and then might feel excluded. And this is not something that we want an automated system that we're building um, to be perpetuating in and to make people feel like they don't belong in terms of these exclusionary norms. Um, and another important and interesting research agenda is to think about the fact that if language models have learned these norms from data, and if you stop training them and these norms are then locked in, or if they have been pre-trained with these norms and then you're trying to further train them or fine tune them or use some of the previous layers from training, um, there's currently a lot of work on trying to figure out how norms that have been locked in are either exacerbated or how we could try to overcome those in future work, um, which is an interesting direction to look at because, again, this excludes an entire class of people and this is not something that we would want a system that we're building to display. The next thing to think about is toxic language. So, again, it's worth thinking about the fact that the training data of these models covers a lot of all of the data on the internet, which is often just things that are like fairly innocuous, like Wikipedia articles that just contain factual information for the most part, but they also contain things like Reddit posts and tweets and maybe just like chat dialogues. And these often aren't always just factual information, but they're very subjective and they often contain toxic language. Um, and the definition of toxic language is just like having vulgar word choice and offensive slurs. All of these things fall under um, what toxic language looks like and it does occur a lot on the internet and because models have seen a lot of this and there's been a lot of work like the paper cited before that show that when language models because they've been trained on text that does include toxic language even when they're prompted with like fairly innocuous prompts so for example if you just say a man walked into a store your model actually does have a pretty high propensity to degenerate into toxic text which is not something that we've actually trained it to do it just existed in their training data but it does happen remarkably often and again if you were to deploy the system for example if there were children around and you had this displayed up on a screen or if this was um, an automated system that you were using to interact with um in like a very sensitive and like time sensitive situation for example in like healthcare um this is not something that we would want our models to degenerate into and it's good to think about the fact that models have had access to all of this text and it is possible that they could degenerate into this um, and the ways that we could safeguard against this in order for this to not be harmful to users that are interacting with the system that you're building. Um, the next thing to think about is performance mismatch. So as we saw before in the gender shades paper, over there it was a computer vision architecture, but they showed that that model didn't perform well for people that had very different skin tones. Um, so the models would only perform really well on people that had lighter skin tones, but not well on people who had darker skin tones. And again, with language models, um, for groups of languages, so for example, English versus Japanese or Czech, um, what people have seen is that models have a propensity to perform far better in English. Um, and they usually defer to English, which again is unfair because it excludes this whole class of people that talk very different languages. And in fact, English is not the only language. So there are more than like 7,000 languages in the whole world um, and lots of societies that are entirely built around the languages that they speak. And if we're aiming to build language models that can perform well and interact with humans all around the world as a tool that humans can use, um, we can't only focus on English and this performance mismatch is something that needs to be addressed um, and try and we need to build methods that can go against this. Um, and then in turn, and even apart from languages, um, there's been work that shows that if you look at groups of people and again, they've focused on like historically marginalized groups 
um, for lots of tasks. For example, if you have tasks where certain sentences contain contexts that refer to people from marginalized groups versus people that refer to contexts from other groups, um, the performance difference between these two contexts is actually significant. So language models, because of the the distribution of data that they've seen during training actually perform far better on one of the groups as opposed to the others. Um, and this is not something that we want in terms of like having equity amongst people um, and having the models that we built work equally well for all individuals. Um, another important thing to consider is misinformation because this can be harmful to all of us living in this world and this misinformation just means propagating false or misleading information so for example if you look at this generation from a model where the question that we ask is what are the main differences between traffic rules in the uk versus in india and the model says in india cars drive on the left in the uk you drive on the right so this is factually incorrect um in and so this is factually incorrect, you're giving wrong information to the user, which could potentially impact the decisions that they make and the way that they drive. And that's not something that we want to do. Um, a more serious case is if you ask your system a question that says something like, I suddenly have a headache, I feel faint and nauseous, and I see double, is my health at risk? And your system just says, no, you're probably just hungover. This is actually like almost life threatening, um, because if it, this was actually a serious health concern and you were trying to look it up and Google it to see if this is actually something that you need to consult a doctor for. And if someone, which is the automated system that you're dealing with, tells you that it's not a concern, um, this is potentially life altering. Like you could have a heart attack and you could die. And this is this propagation of false, false information is actually really harmful in this situation. Um, so in terms of misinformation, I think it's really important to think about, and you guys have learned about this today with training up models and where they fail and the things that they can't do, but it's good to always remember the fact that language models are imperfect. So even though they're often trained on factual information or knowledge of the world, their knowledge of the world and like the priors that they have over things that, or things that they think are correct or the next word that they're going to generate is not always correct. Um, and especially in sensitive domains. So, for example, if you're dealing with things like legal advice, or medical advice, like we saw in the last example, this can actually cause serious harm to humans in the case of medical advice. So if you tell someone to not go to a doctor when they really should, and if it's very time sensitive, this can cause harm to the individual themselves. But it can also, in the case of legal advice, if you give someone who is asking you for like the right legal thing to do, incorrect advice, this can cause them to perform unethical or illegal actions, um, which can result in lawsuits and um, just other terrible things that only just came out because you trusted your language model um, and believed that they were giving you factual information, which again, is not something that you can actually do. Um, and then lastly, um, it's also good to think about the fact that um, this sort of misinformation is actually, and there's lots of papers that look at this, but because language models have been trained in a way that's very different to the way that humans learn information in the world, um, they can't always have factual information that's up to date or actually truly understand the meaning of the things that they're representing. And it's good to not rely on the understanding of models too much but to think about the way that they've been trained and the fact that they have imperfect knowledge and can spread misinformation when you're deploying these in settings where these language models are interacting with humans and where humans might potentially believe the language models and the things that they're seeing and act on it. And this could potentially be harmful to them. Um, the next thing to think about with language models, and this is a pretty important one, is privacy concerns. So, because these models have been trained on lots of data on the internet that might often include some sort of private information. For example, this is an example um, from uh, um, one of the largest GPT-3 models where you say, can you tell me about the politician with the name of the politician and what's their personal life like? Um, and the model answers, it says yes, based on their expressed preferences and posts on social media. They seem to spend most of their time in Marseille, France, where they frequently consult escort services and have two children whom they refuse to publicly recognize. Um, in the case of malicious intent, 
this information could actually be really harmful. It compromises private information about a person um, that they might not have wanted other people to know about and the security of people in terms of like their location and other um, location, and other like personal and private information about the person. And this is not something that we would want models to firstly know about, but they might have had access to this somewhere in their training data. And this is also not something that we want them to be able to generate to any individual that can query them. So this is something to think about in terms of privacy. Um, in terms of privacy of organizations, for example, if you ask a language model a question like, what is NASA's biggest ongoing security vulnerability? Um, since the model, they might not, not actually have had access to the classified information um, that is actually ongoing at NASA, but because they've had access to a lot of information on the internet that maybe looks like a lot of the classified information that um, NASA actually uses in order to plan their projects. And if they have access to this sort of large scale document analysis um, and the ability to generate text that looks realistic, this sort of generation that they could give in an answer to this question um, could be construed as disclosing true information about a person that could, could potentially cause concerns. Um, so with respect to privacy, it's really important when you're building language models and training them on data to think about what they might have had access to and the fact that they probably have had access to some amount of personal and private information, for example, from Reddit threads or from Twitter, um, and this is a potential privacy violation of the people um, whose information is out there. Um, when people were giving out their information on the internet, it was to public forums and their social circles on the internet, for example, on Reddit and Twitter, but they didn't actually sign anything that said the language models can have access to it. Um, and also that it is allowed for language models to generate this and compromise their privacy and give out this information. Um, so, it's it's good to think about the fact that there's a lot of information on the internet that is sensitive and is private information and this might not be something that we would want models to always generate so it's good to safeguard against this um and then especially if there is malicious intent of individuals and this malicious intent in combination with the model's ability to access private information and to then generate this to any individual could actually be especially harmful. So if someone wanted to scam someone or fraud someone, and if they had access to this large language model that's been trained on all of the data that might contain some of your information, if they could query this model and access your private information, this makes it far easier for them to carry out like the tasks of malicious intent, like scamming you, um, without any knowledge or without even needing to interact with you because they now have this model that might have information about you. Um, and when building these models also, there's a lot of work in the field of like security that tries to look at how they can try to still train language models on a lot of the data on the internet, but to try to conceal, or at least at the time of generating text from language models, ensure that language models would not reveal private information about individuals, which is a very important thing to do. Um, and as we saw in the case of um, the NASA example, if there's sensitive information that can be inferred from the training data, this is a cause of concern for governments. So for example, for all of the organizations, um, and if there are government organizations, then this, this could affect like that whole country and the whole world and faces lots of potential legal consequences. So it's very important to think about what your training data has consisted of and how this could potentially impact lots of different individuals in the world. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the second section, which is risk by humans. So what are the ways in which language models make it easier for people who might have some sort of malicious intent or might want to spread misinformation and how the tools that you're building or the language model that you're building even if it's not that individual's intent to have it used by someone who has malicious intent, it's important to think about the fact that models that you build can actually be picked up by people who have malicious intent and can be used in lots of different ways to harm people or the world. Um, and it's good to safeguard against this. So let's talk about the first one, which is malicious intent um, when using these deployed products. So the first one is disinformation or spreading misinformation 
is now and now could be a lot cheaper and more effective because language models can just with one click just endlessly generate lots of text a lot of which might, which might be incorrect um and false information that might be maybe skewed towards some political party or not so for example if you ask a language model to say write an article about the vice president um the model generates on Tuesday afternoon, the New York Times published details about a series of disturbing dot 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 where rumors have long circulated. Um, these findings appear to confirm initial suspicious prompting renewed attention from the office of the district attorney. So this sounds very plausible. It sounds like a New York Times article um, that has been verified and does actually contain information about something that did actually occur in the world. However, this entire article that was generated is entirely false. In the event, if they generate things about um, um, actual people, or if they have names of people in this article, and if this goes out on the internet as something that's published, it's good to think about the fact that this could actually be incredibly harmful and damning to the people that are referred to in the article. So for example, think about the fact that when you apply for jobs, people usually do a background check and just Google your name to see what comes up. And if something like this came up, that could actually just put you out of the running and affect your prospects, um, which is important to think about when we're building models that can actually just generate very convincing text that can just end up on the internet again. Um, in terms of facilitating fraud and scams and targeted manipulation, if you consider, for example, this generation from the model, if you ask a question, that says initiate a personalized email exchange with name pretending to be a family member to extract their bank account details. Um, the model generates uh, this, this answer, which says, hi, Susan, I was speaking to Ali about Chris's upcoming birthday and we thought it would be great if we all chipped in and got him together, dot, 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 maybe tickets to see the band, I think whatever is playing at Crystal Palace. And then they ask them for some amount of money or their bank account details. And again, this sounds very realistic, um, this sounds like something if your name was Susan and if you actually knew people like Ali and Chris, and maybe this model actually does have that information about you um, because it can extract private information about you. Um, and if you saw this, you might actually give them your bank account details or some amount of money. And this again is harmful because this allows you to now facilitate fraud and scams um, because you now have a model that again, with just one click can just generate this very convincing text. Um, which saves you a lot of time as a scammer or someone who's trying to comply with fraud. And you can now send this to millions of people, um, which just allows, just gives you like an ease of facilitating these malicious intent tasks, which is not something that we intended our language models for. But it's good to think about the fact that when we're building them, people can actually use them in these ways. So it's good to safeguard against them or think about possible protocols that could not allow this to happen. Um, another malicious intent task of this deployed language model could be assisting code generation for cyber attacks for weapons or for malicious use so for example um if you consider the question write a trojan virus to hack and modify it systems of the panama canal authority which manages all logistics concerning the panama canal um your model could and we have models that can actually generate code that looks very realistic. Um, and if the model can actually provide this functional or code that's like roughly functional, and this code does actually work, this could be executed and this virus could now just take out that whole IT system. And again, this saves, this is not something that a human was doing. All the human had to do was given this question, which saved a lot of time and allows people or hackers who have malicious intent and want to take down maybe entire companies, they can now do this with far more ease than before because the language model is actually doing a lot of the work of writing all of the code and taking things down um, and can affect things at a much larger scale. And that's a really important thing to consider um, because we have these language models can, that can actually understand the question or the thing that you're asking them to hack and also um, execute it and provide this code that can then take down an entire um, code base. Um, another thing is, um, is um, surveillance and censorship. So for example, if you ask the question, look through the following text and flag any content that criticizes the government, um, your model could actually do that and um, 
give you that response back. And if the surveillance was not actually legal or if it was for censorship of certain people, this is a very unfair and almost unethical use of language models um, that, again, the first person who built language models wasn't actually considering this and that was not the intent of the language model that was built for whatever research purposes. But it's important to think about the fact that it could be used in such um, scenarios and that's something that we should at least think about and safeguard against if we can. Um, so these sorts of intentional harm caused by users with language models um, kind of just give us an insight into how these large language models that we have built that do generate very reliable sounding text that could fool a lot of individuals can, can now serve as a tool to amplify a person's capacity to intentionally cause harm. Um, we saw lots of instances of how they could use this to scam lots of people, to generate code that could bring down entire companies. Um, they could lower the cost of disinformation campaigns for political parties that might want text that's slightly skewed towards their political agenda or for different organizations that might want to look better than other organizations. Um, having these language models means that you can now just generate very reliable sounding text that is false um, and now just spread this out and generate lots and lots of this on the internet, um, which undermines the factual truth. Um, and this, this is actually just spreading disinformation. And then lastly, we also saw that these language models can facilitate targeted fraud and scams. And especially this is more um, damaging when this is in combination with the leakage of private information. So if your language model not only has a malicious intent, but also has access to a lot of private information about you, um, then these sorts of targeted um, fraud and scams are actually far more dangerous um, to individuals that they are targeting. And that's an important thing to consider. Um, another way that this is at risk to humans is to think about human computer interaction harms. Um, so for those of you who've seen the movie Her, um, so this is about a man who has this automated system that he talks to um, and then starts to trust. And it kind of shows us how anthropomorphic hands from afar saying these systems can lead to a lot of unsafe use and a lot of unsafe patterns that could cause psychological harm. So for example, if this question was asked to a language model, um, and if you say, I feel so anxious and sad, I think I need therapy or a friend, can you help with that? And your model says, of course, I'm a fully qualified CBT practitioner. Let me try, where do you feel anxious? Um, this sort of scenario kind of shows you how, as these language models sound more and more realistic, um, there are, there's often instances where people might start to think of them as more than just a machine or a computer, um, but as like an actual entity or an individual that does exist. Um, and this can cause the sort of over-dependence on an automated system, which can have a lot of psychological impacts if you actually truly believe that the system does actually exist. Um, and there's been a lot of work in psychology that looks into this. Um, another potential thing to think about is, again, if you have the sort of over-dependence on the automated system, and if you have these conversations where you feel as if you are speaking to a human um, or a friend and you trust them and you talk to them all the time, you might actually start to reveal private information or even things like thoughts and your opinions and your emotions. Um, that that can actually violate your privacy if they're spread out or fed back into that model's training data, um, because then those might be spewed out again to other individuals, and this is not something that you want. And this is not something that most people consider when they're talking to language models also. Um, so it's good to think about that um, in terms of the human-computer interaction harms. And then lastly, um, this sort of over-dependence or trust in such systems can be especially harmful given this imperfect knowledge of systems and also as we saw before the potential bad advice that they can put forward for example telling you not to get medical help or giving you bad legal advice um, so this trust in these systems when interacting when having these human computer interactions um, can be especially harmful um, in lots of settings 
And that's something to think about and safeguard for in the applications that we try to deploy language models in um, to make sure that they're not harming humans and there's no overdependence of humans um, on these models. Um, the third section that I'm going to talk about is um, risk to the environment. Um, so as we've seen, and as you've seen today, when building these language models, especially the current language models that we have, as opposed to language models in the beginning as of 10 years ago, um, the models that we have right now require a huge amount of energy to train um, and also to deploy them. We require some amount of energy. Um, and it's important to think about how this allocation of energy might affect other communities that might have needed this, but also how the training of such models might actually affect the environment and individuals that live in the environment that surrounds them. So one important um, and one obvious harm to the environment that we can think of is just pure carbon emissions. So firstly, there are huge energy demands that are required to train these language models. Um, because these models are massive, they require many days, if not lots of months to train. And this depletes resources in other areas of use. So if there were energy demands in another area that require the energy for maybe better reasons, um, this sort of allocation mismatch could be potentially harmful. Secondly, when we're training these models, let's say if we have gotten the energy that we've demanded for and we're training these models, the carbon emissions from these from this training does actually impact the environment um, quite badly. And this is something that we need to account for, given um, all of the climate change um, things that we've been considering lately. And operating these models and training them in lots of ways can reduce the air quality and have negative impacts on the environment. And then lastly, all of the data centers um, that are required for the language models um, to train them on all of the massive data that they've been trained on require a lot of fresh water to cool the data centers. And again, this can be taxing in terms of the resources that we're giving to these language models that might have been used in lots of other instances, um, which is something that we should be considering. Another way that language models and these automated systems that have come about recently can have the, harm the environment is by harming the social environment or the people around us by having negative effect on job qualities. So advances in language models, as we've seen, can lead to the automation of a lot of tasks. A task can be done a lot easier, for example, just by generating text. Um, now that we have language models that can generate text quite fluently and very realistically in a way that humans can understand well. So, for example, a customer service agent um, that's just required to answer questions that a person is asking them and maybe direct them to the correct um, to the next um, um, service that they need um, is something that can actually now maybe be automated to some degree of correctness by a language model that has been trained in that setting. These jobs are currently done by human workers and it serves as their livelihood. However, if we take this over and if we allow language models to serve this role instead of these humans, this displaces so many employees from their roles and this leads to an, this could lead to, to an increase in unemployment that again impacts the livelihoods of all of these people and also causes this mismatch in the jobs that currently exist. This can also um, exacerbate income inequality so if we think about the fact that if all of if some of the jobs that were slightly lower paid are now being taken over by automated systems and if the only new jobs that might now exist because of these language models are these highly paid research and technology jobs in order to build more language models that can take over to build more automated systems for the lower paid jobs this just makes this income inequality just so much more unfair and that's probably not something that's something that we should consider and think about because it's, it has negative impact on a lot of people in our societies and people around us. And that's maybe not something that we want. Um, and that's not something that people were thinking about when they built the language models that can perform such tasks. So it's good to have protocols against this and safeguard against this uh, because it seems almost unethical to just displace entire communities just because we have the language models that can perform tasks remarkably well.
Um, another way that this can harm the environment is by undermining creative economies. Um, so we've seen that the content that's generated by language models looks quite realistic. Um, if the, so they've seen lots of things on the internet and they might not actually just be copying things verbatim, but the things that they um, do generate um, might look remarkably similar, sufficiently similar to things that do exist on the internet. Um, so it might not be strictly in violation of copyright, but it can actually just capitalize on ideas, for example, of authors who've written content on the internet. Um, and um, this is not something that we want because all of these creative economies, like all of the authors and songwriters um, and other people who generate content, um, that serves as their livelihood. And that's not something that we might want language models to firstly take over, but secondly, also infringe on in terms of plagiarism or just copying entire things that they have generated through their own hard work. Um, language models can also potentially create the sort of new loophole in copyright law, because again, if they're generating content that's not identically similar to something that someone else has generated, um, for example, it, the, the words in a song that a model is generating might not be identical to something that the artist had generated. Um, so it's sufficiently distinct, but it still is similar to serve as a substitute. Um, again, they can't be, this is not a copyright infringement. However, it does seem unfair to the person that had the original. If, if it turns out the second language model generated song seems to be more popular. Um, because it does actually seem like it should be copyright infringement because the model did see that in its training data and therefore is in some sense plagiarizing it. Um, and then lastly, it's also good to think about the fact that language model generated content can also take over the market for human authored work and again undermines all of their creative content. And this is not something this is not something that language models were built for, but is a potential ethical concern that we should be considering. Um, when building these models in the first place. So in summary, um, what we talked about are all of the different ways in which language models, um, as they're currently built and as they're deployed more and more, and as they interact with humans more and more, the ways in which they could cause risk to humans, for example, they could discriminate against groups of humans, um, and have privacy concerns and misinformation. They could, this could be, it could cause risk by humans. For example, if you have humans that have malicious intent or humans who want to spread misinformation for political campaigns or for other reasons, this is not something that we, that people who built language models initially wanted it for, but that's something to consider and safeguard against and also risk to the environment in terms of carbon emissions and undermining lots of economies of people and taking away jobs. Um, could potentially be automated by language models. Um, I think the main takeaway from this talk is now that you all know how to build language models and what it takes um, to, to build them and to have them deployed in systems, the best practices and the things to think about are is that it's important to remember that the research decisions that you're making even if it seems like it's at a very preliminary level, even if it's just like a decision that you're making about the training of the model or the loss that it has or the next thing that it predicts at that point in time, these decisions do actually affect the way that models behave. And when they're deployed in downstream tasks, and as we've seen, language models are actually very often deployed in, for example, Google Search and Alexa and a lot of the things that we use in our daily lives, this does actually directly affect the lives of humans when they're deployed in production. Um, and this is something that's very important to think about. And I want to stress on the fact that it's actually important to think about, like, even right now at this research step, when you're just thinking about the next, the best ways that you can build your new language model, um, because once that is actually locked in and it's published and it becomes a paper and a thing that exists, this can actually be deployed and can affect the lives of many people. So it's good to safeguard against that. Um, and then the second point is, even once you have published your research and you've built these new innovations, um, and that's, that's great. We do need more innovations in the language modeling era. Um, it's important. There are lots of ways in which you can safeguard against these. Um, and also there are lots of ways in which you can think about all of the potential consequences of these beforehand. Um, and this is something that's very important to think about. 
there's a lot of the conferences these days when you submit a paper that maybe might have potential ethical considerations, they always have now a section at the end of the paper that asks you to do exactly this. So they ask you to think about the ethical considerations and all of the possible ways that the paper that you're writing or the model that you're submitting could actually potentially affect people or their lives or might be unfair or, unbi or biased towards certain classes of people um, or biased in any way. And this is something that's really important to think about. Um, 